Now it's time to discuss footprinting. Now earlier we discussed the hacking methodology, or methods and processes if you will, and the first stage of that was reconnaissance. Footprinting is a part of that reconnaissance stage, and what footprinting does for us is that it helps us gather as much information as we can on a given target. And this target could be a system, it could be a network, it could be an entire organization, or it could be just one person or a few people that work for the organization. Now, what do we need this information for? Well, it helps us start planning our hacking attack. It helps us develop possible attack vectors. It also may give us insight into weaknesses and vulnerabilities of the organization or system. Now, typically we gather information about a wide variety of things having to do with an organization or whatever our target is. But we may gather specific information about certain employees, such as the IT people, the security people, and so forth, or the president of the company even. We also may gather information about the organization itself, what kind of business it does, its business partners, its activities, and so forth. We really want information on the network infrastructure what kind of systems there are, the IP address space, and so forth. And if we can get it, we'd like to have information on any security methods, processes, procedures, or controls that are in place that may prevent us from attacking the organization. Now, footprinting can be either active or passive. Passive footprinting means that there's no direct contact with the organization. We don't actually hack the organization. We don't scan them. We gather information outside the confines of the organization itself. We might use the internet, business databases, and things of that nature. It's pretty much any information we can find online that's available to the public. Now, active footprinting means that there is some kind of direct contact or interaction with our target. And this could be interaction with the people in the form of social engineering, this could also mean physical access. Maybe we enter the premises of the organization disguised as a janitor or a salesperson or a maintenance person or something like that, and we case the joint, to use a term from organized crime. Uh, we may kind of see what the uh, layout is, who works where, what the security is, and so forth. We also may take photos or video to help us plan our attack later. So these are kind of active things we would do to interact with the organization. Again, this is just footprinting. We're not actually attacking an organization yet. We're just gathering information. And the things I've mentioned will help us gather information on the organization. Now, what are our sources? And we'll go through these a little bit more in depth as we go through the course. But some sources that come to mind immediately include internet searches, searching uh, websites and so forth that may have information about the target, Google hacking is a big one, and we'll talk about that specifically. A, the Whois database, which gives us information about uh, the network and domain of a target. DNS footprinting does that as well. We also may look at organizational websites, the company website, and its different pages that are on the website that may give us information. Again, this is all publicly available information. And what we're doing is we're trying to assemble a database of the organization. We're trying to gather pieces of a puzzle to put it together. We also may look at social media because a lot of employees, even companies these days, have social media sites like blogging sites and so forth. We also may look at job sites that belong to the company or to another job search agency like Monster.com or something like that. Obviously, we'll try social engineering, maybe talking to employees, getting information from them. We may surveil the facilities, take pictures or video of the uh, organization and its physical facilities. We also may get information from market partners or even competitors about the organization. There's a lot of public resources out there like uh, the SEC and so forth. There's marketing materials from the company itself that may give us information. And there's compliance or legal reports that are out there. A lot of companies and organizations have to file certain mandatory reports in order to comply with governance or the law. All of these are sources of really good information. Now you may ask yourself, what kind of information am I after as a hacker? Well, on the screen here are some things that we actually are looking for. Again, each little piece of this information that we gather can help us plan out an attack, different attack vectors possibly, tell us where weaknesses are, also possibly tell us where the defenses are that we may have to get around. Some things we're looking for in footprinting are an IP address range for their network, what types of computer systems and equipment such as routers, firewalls, and so forth they may have, 
what kind of operating systems they use, maybe even applications, database versions, and so forth. Uh, we're looking at key personnel. Who is the security person? Who is the IT person? Uh, who are the senior managers? We may be trying to get phone numbers so we can conduct social engineering attacks on those folks. We may also be looking at business relationships, maybe the relationship with the company to another company or to a competitor, or even relationships that businessmen and women have with other business personnel. We may look at contracts that they have with other companies to determine what kind of uh, business ventures they're planning together, products they're producing. We may look at financial data. Uh, a lot of this information is not relevant to the attack, but it can tell us information. It may even help us build a target. Uh, based upon financial data, we may decide that uh, there's some money in this attack. So maybe they could afford blackmail or something like that. So there's all kinds of information a hacker may want for different reasons. We also are looking for security methods and procedures. You know, what kind of security processes and controls are in place? And obviously, we're also looking for information about the network infrastructure, what protocols are used, uh, and things of that nature. So this is the information we're looking at when we talk about footprinting, and all of this helps us build a database of information about the organization or the target. Now let's discuss some of the footprinting methods available to us that we can use to gather some of this information we've been talking about. Your first method is probably the most common, and it's probably what you'll start with first, and that's the search engine. Now you can use your favorite search engine, whether that's Google, Yahoo, Bing, whatever. As a matter of fact, it's probably a good idea to use multiple search engines simply because each one may return different results in a different order. And the reason you want to do search engines first is generically you're just looking for general information on a target. If it's a person, obviously you're doing a name search on that person. If it's a company, you're doing a company name search. Maybe you're searching also on their products. And those search results will get you pointed in the right direction to other sites. Now, obviously, you may go to the company or organizational website or personal website next. And the public website's fairly easy to get to. And what you may want to do is peruse that site when you have the time or download the entire site using some of the software that's available to do that. There's software that you can download that will grab entire websites and bring them down to your computer. And it'll download the structure and reconstruct it for you in a folder. It'll download all the links, the pictures, the content, everything. So you can look at that and examine it later. You also may want to look at the source code for the websites so that you can tell if there's any security issues possibly within the source code itself. We'll discuss that a little bit later as well. Another site you may want to look at are partner sites. And these are uh, sites that may belong to market partners of the organization that you're looking at. And they may have information about their partner company that you can't find in other places. They also may have reviews of products and in your internet searching you may find product reviews for products that this company creates so you can get even more information about them. Internal and intranet sites are good if you can get to them and usually the only way you can do that is to be on the inside of the network and you're not at that stage yet. However, there are some external public websites that aren't constructed from a secure uh, point of view, and it is possible to get from a public website to an internal website. This doesn't happen much, but it is possible where there are organizations that put both their internal and external websites on the same server. They don't separate them out. They don't secure them. So it is possible, but it doesn't happen very often. Now, the next thing you might look at is email, and we're going to go through some of this a little bit more in depth as we go through the course, but email is one way you can get information about the organization's personnel, its server infrastructure, and the route it takes to get from sender to recipient. And I'm not talking about invading someone's email and reading it, although you could do that at some point later on in the attack. For now, I'm talking about just the email headers. And there are tools that you can use to send emails to an individual on the inside of the company. And you can use that to track where the email travels through the Internet and into their company uh, servers. So you could examine the email headers, maybe examine read receipts and so forth to get information about their internal structure, their internal IP address ranges, and so forth. There's email search tools available to you that we'll discuss. And 
you can use these tools again to track email. Another method is Google hacking, and Google hacking is the topic of an entire chapter coming up that we'll discuss. And basically, you use search directives, advanced search directives, and the Google hacking database to get information, particular information about an organization's infrastructure. We also have who is and DNS methods and basically who is is a registrar that gives us domain information who the contact information is in the company the IP address range and so forth DNS footprinting will give you information about the company's name server structure internal and external DNS's domain information IP addresses and so forth you might also get information about their internal servers and how their structure is on the inside of the network Social media is another great source, and this involves, in some cases, watching your, the social media accounts like uh, blogs, Facebook, LinkedIn, personal sites, and so forth that belong to the organization's employees. And you can get a lot of information about the organization or the individual through social media. People will put all kinds of things on social media without really thinking about it sometimes. A lot of things they shouldn't. So it's a great source for footprinting an organization or a target. Social engineering is another method, of course, that involves direct contact with the individuals that may work in an organization or are associated with it. This could be casual meetings in bars. It could be targeted contacts, like maybe you pretend to be a salesperson and make a sales call appointment with that target. Uh, but you can use social engineering methods that we'll discuss a little bit later to try to get information out of the individual, maybe about future products that are coming up, maybe about the network infrastructure. Uh, security policies and so forth. Other sources of information may include partners and competitors obviously or also suppliers and there's a wide variety of ways you can get this information by examining the documents and websites from those other sources using social engineering with those other sources and so forth. So again the whole point is to get information about your target whether that's the organization, the person, the network infrastructure, whatever. And you can use these methods, and, and we'll go through a lot of them in depth as we go through this part of the course and explain how you would actually use these methods to gather information about your target. Internet searching is probably where you'll start first when you begin your footprinting exercise against an organization or a person. Now, internet searching is very easy. We do it all the time in our daily lives these days. And again, that's where footprinting really starts. What you do is you're going from the general to the specific. So the first thing you do in the general sense is to go ahead and do internet searches on a particular target. This could be a company name. This could be an individual's name. This could be any number of search terms that relate to the target that you're after. Now, obviously, you would use different search engines because you may get different results with each one of them. So try Google, Bing, Yahoo, and you'll find that by and large you'll get the same results, but they may be ordered differently. The other thing I would tell you is dig deeper than just the first few pages. You may get 50,000 hits in a general search like this. And those are typically the most popular results, meaning that's what people have searched on the most. So the statistics have been driven up to the number one, two, three, and even the hundredth place. But those may not contain the information you're really looking for about the organization. There may be pages buried in there that have good information on them that aren't searched as regularly or aren't looked at. The other thing about internet searching is don't just limit to search engines. Obviously, there's a wide variety of other tools you can use when we're footprinting. We're talking about people searches, obviously, like Zaba, Intellis, and so forth. Some of these are free and some of these are paid. And you'll find if you run several of them, even, even if it's the free ones, you'll get a little bit different information every time. And in some cases, they will cross-reference each other or cross-check each other, and you can actually glean information from using several of them at once. In one search engine, for example, you might get half of an address. In another search engine, you might get the other half or another piece of the puzzle. So do that with multiple search engines, even with the people searches. Obviously, social media is a big one. That's where you're going to look at what people have out on their blog sites, their personal websites, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so forth, and hit all of these. And not just about the person, although we typically associate social media with a person, organizations, companies, and so forth 
now have their own Facebook page, for example. You'll also find their own uh, personal websites for employees. That's what you're looking for. Anything related to the organization and its people during footprinting. LinkedIn is a very popular professional site where you'll find all manners of professionals out there, IT people, doctors, lawyers, and so forth. And a lot of these profiles are public, but obviously if you really want to get to the specifics about a profile, you may have to create an account because some of these are not visible in normal searches to the public, or they may only show you a little bit of information. So definitely get a LinkedIn account, probably want to get a Facebook account and so forth. But check all of these different internet search sites social media, blogs, personal websites, and also look at partner websites. When you do general search terms on the company, you may come up with partners that the company has worked with and done business with. So you'll obviously want to go with uh, one of those organizations as well. There's also obviously Google Earth and Bing Maps. You can use those to pinpoint the location of the company and its branch offices, get an idea of how they look. And this is actually the start of physical security penetration testing because once you look at the location, you can kind of see the terrain. Maybe you can get a good enough photograph from Google Earth or Bing to give you an idea of the right ways to approach the facility or any obstacles that might uh, hide you or just things of that nature. So those are obviously good types of uh, searches to perform on an organization. Now, obviously, all of this sounds very simple, but this is where you start. Again, we go from the general to the specific, and footprinting is very general. Obviously, you wouldn't want to ignore the company sites, uh, any business sites that may have information on them as well. There's also things like the Edgar database and the SEC database that will tell you general information about the company in terms of how long it's been in operation, maybe its CEO and executive staff, and so forth. So you really want to check out some of these sites as well. Let's go ahead and do a quick search on a company here and just look at generally how the information might be located and found. Okay, we're in Google. I'm just going to do a Google search on the virtual training company. And that is VTC, and those are the folks who produce these training packages for you that you're looking at right now. And obviously, there's a lot of stuff out there on virtual and training and company, so you'll get hits on any part of the search term. So right now, we've got about 77 million results, and that's actually an awful lot. And we'll show you later when we talk about Google hacking and Google searches how you can narrow that down. Just to give you an idea of what all is out there, obviously we have the vtc.com website and that might be the main site we're looking for. But there's also other places you might look. The reviews for VTC, um, their Facebook page, the LinkedIn page for VTC. So you see that all these different sites out there contain information about the virtual training company. And these are probably the most popular sites, but also Feel free to dig in uh, later on in the pages about some of these different terms that are out there buried deep, the different search results. So like you have virtual training company uh, from Black Cat World. This is in 2008, but you can actually get information maybe that's been out there for a while on a company and now you can't find it anywhere. So you might get more relevant, older information out there if you need it. It's just an example of some of the internet searching you can do, obviously. You've done this before, and again, this is very general, and that's where footprinting starts. The next topic of discussion is Google hacking. Now, Google hacking can help us narrow our internet searches down to a manageable number. It can also go after very specific terms and dig those out from thousands of websites. Google hacking, basically the term comes from using Google itself, the popular search engine, to develop more defined, refined queries that return a more narrow set of results for us. Instead of 50,000, we might just get 1,000, for example, and they will be more relevant to what we're really after. We could use multiple search terms in the window uh, in a normal internet search and get back thousands, hundreds of thousands of documents but most of them will focus either on one particular part of the search term. You'll very rarely see one result back that has every single search term in there. You might see a couple here and there, but it usually won't be what you're looking for. So we actually use Google's search language, if you will, keywords that are there, operators and so forth, to get more specific information out of Google. Now, it really isn't focused specifically on hacking. It just came into being because hackers really were the ones who really first understood how to use Google search 
keywords and search operators to drag out specific information. You can use these search operators in your daily normal internet searches and be just fine. It really is not hacking focused. It's just that we typically see Google hacking associated with hackers because they're the ones who are really using it. Now you use these keywords and these operators and basically they can help you sift through thousands of documents to find very specific information about the search term that you're looking for. And these operators will help you look in web URLs themselves, also in the website titles. They'll help you find directories, sensitive information, and so forth. You can even find particular documents, like find all PDFs on a site, or find all Word docs on a site, for example. Now, basically, you're using these operators to narrow these search results down. And there's a couple out there that we'll talk about. There's all in URL and in URL. And all in URL means I want every single term that I've typed in the search, I want every single URL that has all of those terms. You can also narrow it down to just some of those terms by saying in URL. If I said I want VTC.com, it would find all the pages that had VTC.com in the URL. You can also look in the title of the website. There's all in title and in title. All in title basically gives you the search term in its entirety that's located in the title of the website. And obviously, in title has some or parts of the search term in the title of the website itself. So typically, you might use a search term and get information back where your search term is uh, located throughout the website. But in title and in URL are very specific in that it has to be in the URL or in the title of the website. And that can help you find things a little bit better. And basically, how these queries are constructed can be a little bit problematic. So that's why we use something called the Google Hacking Database. The Google Hacking Database is hosted in several different sites and we'll look at one of them in the next session when we do our demo and basically it already has search terms built search terms constructed such that you could go ahead and build your own term and find the information you're looking for so you actually get a little help there there's also a lot of websites out there that show you that tutor you in how to build these queries so I would definitely recommend taking a look at those so the different operators you might have are all in title which again all of the search term will be in the title of the website. You also have in title, which means parts of the search term will be in the title, not necessarily all of the search term. You have all in URL and in URL. All in URL means that the entire search term you typed in, and it's usually a URL itself, has to be located in the URL of the target website, whereas in URL means parts of the search term can be in there. You also have info which tells Google to bring back uh, the information about the search term and it lists you in a condensed form the information it can find. You also have related and related will tell Google to find websites related to your search term. Then you have link and link will tell you the list of websites that actually link to the search term. So let's go ahead and look uh, at Google hacking a little bit. We'll do this in this session and the next session. Okay, we're at Google here, and the first thing I want to do is we saw how many web hits we got when we just did a search on VTC or Virtual Training Company. So let's do all in URL, and then you put the colon there, and then your search term, no spaces. And let's say uh, VTC.com. And this gives us all the sites where the term VTC.com completely is in the URL to the website. So anything you get back should have VTC.com in the actual URL. And this includes the LinkedIn site. It includes uh, any other sites like here. This website is reviewing uh, VTC.com. So it has the entire VTC.com URL as part of its URL. And if we did a search on just in URL using that term, we would find the various parts of it in there. And that might give you a much broader search. All in URL tends to narrow it down. Now, obviously, we saw how we had over 77 million results a while ago when we did uh, just a search on VTC.com, but now we've narrowed it down to 187,000. So this gives you a little bit more of a narrow search. In our next session, we'll cover some of the other operators that we find and use with Google Hacking. Okay, the next search term we're going to look at is the in title an all-in-title search term for Google Hacking. Now, a couple of things before we do that. Notice that in our previous session, 
we did all in URL with a colon and vtc.com. So you really need to specify a term that is likely to be inside of a URL here, and we specified btc.com. We could have specified any other term really to see if it would have been in there. We could actually, let's go ahead and go VTC and see what we get. And see, we broaden our results out a little bit, unfortunately, then, because we see vtc.com here, but we also see vtc.edu, which has nothing to do with the virtual training company, and so forth. So it's really better when you do the all in URL or in URL searches to simply do a URL in there. You probably get more refined results out of that. So let's look at all in title. And uh, although they can be daunting at first, you'll see that these particular search terms, these operators, aren't very complicated to use at all once you know the syntax and what keyword does what, what operator does what. So let's do an all in title, VTC. Let's just do VTC initially. Now we got about a million five results on that. So we see VTC's Wikipedia page, um, other URLs that have VTC in there, and this would be in the title of the website itself. So it might have been better to just go ahead and say VTC.com, although you might not see URLs specifically in titles. So maybe a URL is not the best search term to put into an all entitled search, but it does get you started. So you can see here where vtc.com would be in the title of the website. So let's say that you were to put something like um, passwords in here. And this would mean that the word password is in the title. So here you have the title of the website and the word passwords in there. And what you might do if you're learning to do uh, these Google hacking searches, is look and see how these websites are set up. You know, they may talk about passwords, but there also may be websites that have passwords in their actual passwords. And this is actually where the Google Hacking Database comes in. If we uh, look at the Google Hacking Database, originally it came out and it was started by the Hackers for Charity. This is their website right here. But you'll find that a lot of other people also mirror the site. Uh, ExploitDB is uh, one I look at quite a bit. And basically the Google Hacking Database uses uh, these terms and kind of shows you what is out there. Like uh, this is uh, as of September 2013 is the last entry here. Um, they have these entries and what category it falls into like viewing online devices, viewing configuration files, files containing passwords. So if we actually, let's look at this one, this file containing passwords. And this basically shows you how they have developed the, the search term. And if you click on it, they have the search term, file type, key, and so forth. So you get these particular results back. And what this search term was, was begin RSA private key. So basically, you're getting private people's private keys or organizations' private keys. So um, that could be very bad information to have out there if you're an organization. You could also alter these search terms and use them for what you want to, to include in the operation that you're doing against the organization, whatever your target is. Let's go back here, back to the Google search, uh, or rather the Google Hacking Database. And there's several other ones out there. If you scroll down, it'll give you footholds, files containing usernames, sensitive directories, vulnerable files, vulnerable servers, error messages, files containing passwords. Let's take a look at that. And uh, again, some of these are recent and some of these are very old. They go back several years. But like, uh, let's hit one from uh, last April from April of 2013. And this basically is login and username and password details from the .sql file. So you're seeing uh, what a Google hack search comes up with in terms of looking for .sql files, passwords in them. And some of these may be default password or the word password. And you can obviously alter these queries as you need to target your particular organization. So that's the Google Hacking Database and the, an introduction to Google Hacking to the keywords and search terms. And we haven't really gone in depth on it, and I would recommend that you practice this. 
you can't really hurt anything by doing Google hacking. You can't hurt an organization or yourself by doing it. It's not an intrusive. You're just searching for information that's already out there. And in some cases, an organization should do this to themselves to find out what sensitive information is out there about them. And then they can do what they need to do to mitigate that. So that's Google hacking in a nutshell. Just a quick introduction. You really need to be familiar with the search operators and keywords in order to uh, prepare for the exam. So go ahead and practice those at your leisure. For the next topic, I'd like to go a little bit more in depth on email headers and footprinting using email. Now, email footprinting basically doesn't involve anything like reading other people's email or sending messages to the SMTP server. That comes a little bit later. Remember, we're talking footprinting, typically passive, mostly non-invasive. So footprinting with email basically involves viewing the header information that you might get in an email you've received to determine information about the email as it's traveled from the sender to the receiver over the internet and through various servers. Now this header information that you can look at in an email can tell you actually a lot of information about the organization. It can tell you IP addresses, server names, banners that can help you determine what kind of operating system is running on the email server or what email application is running. You can also get username format for the internal network in some cases. You can even get usernames because frequently someone's email address is their username and that would help you determine what kind of username structure they have on their internal network. You also might get other information about the email infrastructure at an organization or even the entire network. Now most email clients that you would use, including Outlook, Thunderbird, Eudora, um, even web-based email can give you header information. And what we're actually going to do here in a moment is look at header information that came through Gmail, as a matter of fact. So I'm going to show you a slightly edited email header and point out some of the things that you can get from email footprinting. Let's go ahead and take a look at that now. Okay, we're looking at an email header and what I've done is I've printed this out and put it into a PDF for you. And I have to confess up front, I have edited this information a little bit because I didn't want to uh, put uh, anyone's email address or IP addresses out there uh, for the public to see. So I've slightly edited this. So that's my full disclosure here, but uh, pretty much I've left most of it intact. This is an email that came to one of my Gmail accounts, my vtc.author account. That's my actual email address. So if you care to email me about the course, feel free to, or go through the VTC uh, website to do so. But uh, what we're looking at is information about this email, metadata, if you will, and how it was sent and where it went through, and a little bit of information about the sender because this will give us information about the sender's infrastructure. Now I actually have a made up person that sent this email and I have uh, replaced the actual email servers with just uh, generic names here as well as the IP addresses. Keep in mind these are not the actual IP addresses from the email. I have altered those so again full disclosure on that to protect the innocent, change the names of the guilty and so forth if you will. Okay one of the things we see is the IP address of the receiver and that might be of interest to us but what we're really after is the path the email took and you can look through here and see that it was received from mail server one mail server one dot somewhere dot org okay and that's the mail server's name and its IP address and it was received at this IP address on this date for vtc author at gmail dot com on this date and time and a little bit of information here uh, you see the IP address of the organization, the sender, if you will. So that tells you a little bit about them. Their mail naming structure, mail.server1.somewhere.org. That's their fully qualified DNS name. And let's see if we can uh, pull this down a little bit. And one thing you'll see of note is this mail server is using Axway Mailgate 5.1.0 and we also know that it's using Novell GroupWise so now we know a little bit about what the mail server is running. Novell GroupWise using uh, this um, Axway Mailgate server if you will. And this comes from uh, Jane Doe and obviously I've changed the name there someone at somewhere.org for me and uh, basically you've gotten some information now about the IP address of the sender, their mail server, 
and what they're running on the email gateway. So that's a little bit of information you can use to help fingerprint the organization. So now that we know that they're using uh, a Novell gateway, we can actually look for vulnerabilities that might affect that particular type of email gateway. Um, the Novell GroupWise Internet Agent and the Axway MailGate. So we've gotten a little bit of information about this uh, individual from the email headers themselves. So that's all email footprinting really is. And depending upon what kind of email service they're running, and also depending upon what kind of client you're using, you may be able to get other different information as well from the email headers. You also may get uh, information about the route it took through the internet. So that could be helpful to you. So it's just a little bit of information that's out there in the email header for you. The next topic covers a different kind of footprinting. That's who is footprinting and DNS footprinting. Now those two types of footprinting can give you information about an organization's network. What you may find is the domain name of the organization through their domain name registration and this would give you information about their IP address space, possibly who the registrar is, a point of contact with the organization, sometimes even an address and phone number of the organization. But it can give you a lot of different information. Now, the Who Is footprinting basically uses the registration information from things like the Internet, where you would first buy a domain name or from one of the other registrars. You would buy the domain name, you would register it for a given amount of time, pay your money, and then it's out there. Now, a lot of this information has typically been public and easily accessible, although recently we're starting to see ways that information can be kept private through the registrar themselves. DNS footprinting, on the other hand, is used to determine some similar information about the organization, like the name servers and other infrastructure type of information. So you'll get a lot of the same kinds of information from both of these sources, but it's good to use both and cross-check and make sure that you have the most current information and the most accurate information. So let's go ahead and take a look at who is in DNS footprinting. I'm on the website DomainTools.com and I just arbitrarily picked this, but there are several different who is search engines out there and they all access the same who is records there are sites you just do a search on who is lookup and you'll find several of them and you can use your favorite whichever one you like and i picked this particular one at random and i'm just going to type in vtc.com and do a lookup on it just to see what i get now who is records are publicly available out there there's no hacking into another system to get them so let's see what uh, information we can find on the virtual training company. We have our registrant, Keith Provost, and the uh, address and so forth actually belongs to Network Solutions. That's their registrar who they bought the domain name from. And we see some information here that's interesting. We get uh, the technical contacts, but they are at Network Solutions at the registrant. Previously, some earlier Who Is records basically had the phone number and address of the company itself versus the registrar. So you can see that they originally. Um, bought their record in 1993 and it expires currently in August of 2023. One thing you have to do is watch for the expiration on domain names because there are a lot of people out there who will see that something's about to expire and buy it outright out from under a company if they're not paying attention. They let it expire, it can be bought and then they'll typically hold that domain name for ransom and want money in order to sell it back. Because once they expire, technically they're out there for anyone to buy and use. Uh, we also see that VTC lists its domain servers here, uh, ns0.dnsmadeeasy.com. So that's who they use for their DNS service, and they have five DNS servers out there. So they're not hosting their own DNS. They've let a third party take care of that. Um, so that actually would make it more difficult to hack an organization as if you outsource some of your infrastructure and services to an organization that does that and is really good at doing it. In this case, they've outsourced their DNS here, so that DNS is not part of their infrastructure. We can tell that immediately. So we've gotten a little bit of information here. We've got the name of a point of contact at VTC. Uh, we know who their registrar is. We know where their name servers are. So uh, the next thing we might want to do is do a DNS uh, footprint on them. And for that, we could go to a place like uh, dnsstuff.com which is a very popular DNS search tool. So you might want to put in uh, their name here, vtc.com again. 
Let's see if we can get any additional information on DNS footprinting. We may get some of the same information, and that's okay, because we can ensure that what we've got is accurate and up-to-date and hasn't changed. So this can actually serve to confirm what we already know, and it can also give us additional information. Okay, so our query uh, finished running, and we have um, some results here. And what it does is it not only looks and gives us information about the organization, but it also tells us a few things about their DNS status here. We can see that we have the uh, same DNS servers listed here. And we also now have the IP address range for those DNS servers. There could be information here from the uh, from uh, querying them, from pinging them, or whatever. We scroll down, we can see it gives you a lot of information about different requirements for DNS that are good best good practices or best practices. Typically, not necessarily security issues, but there may be some issues that a query will find that may affect performance here. So it gave us a warning for the SOA field check, the Start of Authority field check. We also got information on MX records, which are mail server records, so we conceivably could get the mail server IP address and host name. They have different mail server addresses here. It could be due to outsourcing. And uh, one good thing, it says it's a fail, but it's a good thing, is connections to the mail server have uh, failed. That means that you can't get to a mail server and do damage to it. So there were no connections allowed to that mail server, and that's good. So a lot of different information here that we can see. And you can run these queries on your own to practice with who is in DNS, and I would highly recommend that you do that. In our last segment on footprinting, what we want to talk about now is how to defeat footprinting, how to as much as you can, minimize the ability of an attacker to footprint your organization. Now, footprinting can be minimized, but you can't necessarily eliminate it. And that's simply because there will always be some information out there on the World Wide Web, on the Internet, in social media, and so forth. And really, you wouldn't want to take away every piece of information because you obviously have to have an Internet presence for your organization to survive. This will be in the form of advertising, your own websites, connections. So all of that's positive, and some of that information, unfortunately, can be used in the negative for an attacker. Those are the chances you take. But you can minimize the sensitive information out there at least and try to make sure that it's uh, not out there in bulk, that uh, it's been carefully reviewed and looked at before it gets out there. So you should review all the information published on any websites that goes out in email, obviously, and that uh, appears in social media to make sure that it's sanitized and cleaned of potentially sensitive information. You might want to establish a policy where anything that's put out on the Internet, even by a, an employee on their personal social media site, is subject to review by the company. You need to make that policy and enforce it so that things that shouldn't be out there don't get out there. The other thing you need to do is train and educate your users on how footprinting works and how to avoid leaking this sensitive information about your organization and about themselves. You wouldn't want the uh, employee to put out company phone numbers or talk about uh, security issues, for example, on their blog site that the company has. So make sure you take care of this by training and education and reviewing all the information that goes out as much as you can. Now, some of the things you really want to restrict from going out there, any type of personnel names or information, like the name and address of the CEO, for example, or the technical points of contact within the company, limit the information you put out there. Maybe put out a central 1-800 number and the company's post office address for any technical issues or business issues. Let them call the 1-800 number and then direct them to the right person. Don't put that information out there. You also might not want to put out any information on the architecture of the company, its network, its infrastructure, and so forth. And don't talk about any equipment upgrades. One thing you probably shouldn't do is on websites, particularly job sites, is talk about the operating systems you use and the different systems. Obviously, you can't avoid that completely because when you put a job ad out on a job site, you're going to be asking for people with specific skills. But you could figure out a way to narrow it down, to ask for people with database experience, for example, versus people with 
um, MSSQL 2000 experience. So you might want to do that. Any kind of organizational changes like reorgs or anything like that you might not want to put out there or at least manage the information that goes out about the organizational change. Something like uh, an IPO about to happen or stock prices about to go up or down is sensitive information. So you want to control it until it's time to get out there and control the manner that it's released. Any kind of internal or sensitive information that you don't want out on the internet, that's what you should control. You should create a policy that uh, defines your information, defines the categories for it, the sensitivity of it, and what you're willing to do to protect it and train your users on how to protect that information. So identifying that information that could be harmful to you during footprinting is important. Now what are some other things you can do obviously to uh, minimize footprinting? Well try to limit your competitive intelligence and that basically goes along with everything else we just talked about that you should limit. Any business practices or business partnerships or new product lines limit what you put out on that. Uh, anyone you deal with, you should require non-disclosure agreements with so that they do not disclose any competitive information or competition-sensitive, proprietary information, that sort of thing. You also might want to do your own periodic searches. Do Google hacking on your own organization, your own company, even yourself and the people that work there to determine what's out there. Knowing what's out there is half the battle because once you know what's out there, you can do a couple of things to minimize it or change it if you need to. Be suspicious of overly inquisitive persons. We're going to talk about social engineering later on in the course, but social engineering can be used to footprint an organization as well. So be suspicious of people who are overly inquisitive. Educate your people on this as well. People who call and ask for company information that really the public shouldn't know. Uh, also screen your waste and trash. A lot of information, again this relates to social engineering, but a lot of information goes into the dumpster that shouldn't go there. Company phone books, product manuals, and so forth. So screen that type of information and make sure it doesn't go out there. The big thing with footprinting is educate people on what information they should not be putting out on the internet or uh, public sites or social media, blogs, and so forth. Educate them on footprinting and how a hacker does it so that they can see why you don't want this information out there. Educate your users, your customers, your executives, your technical people on footprinting and what it can do to the company in terms of giving an attacker information to use during an attack. So education is probably the best thing you can do. It's probably the most effective thing you can do to reduce footprinting. Again, you can't completely eliminate it, but you can minimize it whenever you can.